Well, it's a great pleasure to be here in front of you, and uh, thanks for the very kind words, Maya. Um, I'm actually extremely impressed that there's so many people in the audience considering you're in a beautiful city and it's a gorgeous Sunday morning. I don't know if that reflects necessarily well on you or just really poor judgment, because you're gonna get rewarded with having to listen to me for about an hour and a half today. Um, but for those of you who have actually taken some time off and are new to the area, you'll realize why I showed up 11 years ago for one year and haven't kind of left since. All right, so let's move into my topic rather than carry on too much. I just wanted to put something in perspective, which is to appreciate the fact that cesarean deliveries were done on dead and dying women. This was a procedure that only in the 18th and 19th century do we have even accurate reports of women surviving the procedure. And it's moved from that to something that clearly is an extremely uh, popular surgery. In fact, it's the most common surgical procedure in the United States. And one of the biggest progresses we've made is, if you can see from the picture up there, that um, um, our babies are now naked and not the surgeons. All right, so um, this is rates from the WHO in terms of the number of cesarean, cesarean deliveries we do. It's 2008 data, so we're probably around 32%. But you can see it's not a US problem, it's a worldwide problem. And because it's so ubiquitous, it's no longer life-saving surgery and we have to undertake uh, to make it as pleasant as possible because patients certainly aren't worried if they're gonna live and die prior to a, a cesarean delivery. They're gonna worry about a lot of the more subtle things. And we actually asked these exact questions to a cohort of about 100 women a few years ago prior to their cesarean delivery. We asked them if they were gonna go for a cesarean delivery, what analgesic outcomes would you most want to um, avoid, we allow them to rank them and then to pay a theoretical $100 towards avoiding the outcomes they'd most want to. And because pain during cesarean and pain after the two ones that were highlighted, this is what the next two talks are going to be about. But please appreciate that when you treat pain, you do introduce side effects. So from a population point of view, most patients prior to cesarean delivery will tolerate side effects uh, for good pain relief, but this under individual circumstances may vary this ranking. I'm gonna cover techniques that we can use as well as highlight in particular intrathecal dosing regimens that we can utilize. And it's a lot to cover, so sort of cursorily cover a lot of areas. I'm happy to field questions in the panel. I don't have to convince anyone in the audience that it's better to do cesareans under neuroaxial technique. And there's a lot of maternal benefits, neonatal advantages, and overall a better experience. And it's with all of these that got highlighted um, in the 80s and 90s that led to a complete change in the way we do things. And I'm just highlighting the slide on the left being the US data and the slide on the right from the UK, how general anesthesia for cesarean uh, sections has largely disappeared and how low should your cesarean section rate and uh, general anesthesia for cesarean section be? Well, the Royal College gives some guidance towards that. They say for an elective case, less than 1%, less than 3% for a non-elective, this is a laboring woman going back, and in an urgent situation, maybe as high as 15%. But um, we can all aim for much lower, and you heard from Lawrence Sen um, how you can actually have rates well below 1% for uh, general anesthesia for cesarean delivery. So what is the best technique? And uh, my preference is spinal. This is based on some work that was done at Stanford as well as other areas. But the big advantage, it is quicker. Uh, the time saving that we found at our institution, 29 versus 46 minutes from a wheels into surgical incision. Uh, this extrapolated to a cost effective uh, procedure over an epidural. And it is also more effective compared to an epidural in the fact that it provides better analgesia. Um, in a large database by Bloom and colleagues um, found that a significant less number of failures as well to convert in, conversions to general anesthesia in elective situation. So on balance for us, a spinal is a better technique. But there are variations of an epidural, and obviously a, a CSC, a combined spinal epidural, which you're all aware of, it has the benefit of the intrathecal component, but the epidural catheter to be able to dose later on if you require it, especially with prolonged surgery, but also it allows you to perhaps reduce your dose, um, and I'll show you examples of that. 
The one concern with the CSE technique is if you do do the spinal and you don't check the catheter, you have an untested catheter, although studies are in this particular area would suggest that it's very small likelihood of failure in this setting. So I don't know if you've ever heard of the concept of Eve. This is no relation to Adam, but basically what it implies is that you can push your intrathecal block up just by virtue of dosing through your epidural needle. And as a proof of concept, um, Blumcott and colleagues looked at this, just looking at 10 ml of normal saline or bupivacaine, and both pushed your dermatomal uh, block up by um, four dermatomes. So it seems like it's a volume effect. Some people say it may even be a pressure effect, just by opening up the epidural space um, to atmosphere, you can push up your spinal block. And examples of how this would work in a clinical practice, there's two examples as I've illustrated here, that authors showing that a nine milligram dose versus a five milligram with a six uh, ml epidural uh, bolus was able to get similar anesthesia. So it is a real phenomenon that you can utilize in clinical practice. And in particular in Europe, this has been taken over uh, with a so-called sequential CSE technique, where you give a small intrathecal dose. Um, in this particular description, we get a block to around uh, T8, 9, and then slowly push it up with your epidural administration. And they report better analgesia and less supplementation if you compare it to an epidural technique, not necessarily a spinal technique. Obviously, this is more time consuming, but it does allow you a chance to test your catheter along the way. The concern I have for a lot of these techniques where we start blending two different techniques is what are we really using? And it feels like we go full circle back to an epidural technique. If you look at the um, two examples, nine and 10% requirement for supplementation in two of these descriptions is a lot higher than you would accept if it, in an intrathecal spinal um, technique. But it is something you can consider in certain patients, in particular ones where you're trying to minimize your local anesthetic, avoiding hyper <coughs> hypotension and pushing the block up slowly. <coughs> so we looked at um, what the SOAP um, populace use, utilize what techniques. It's not just me to, that has a preference towards spinal anesthesia. A few years ago, we asked SOAP members, and this was presented by Alex Batwick. And overall, about 90% of uh, elective cesarean deliveries are done under spinal, and about 10% utilizing a CSE technique. And we aren't really alone in this. If you look at UK data, similar amounts of um, percentage of clinicians are utilizing a spinal anesthesia for elective cesarean delivery. And it's because of this that I'm going to focus the rest of the talk on how we can optimize the spinal anesthetic that we give for cesarean. And I became interested in discovering and learning about spinal cocktails. I was sort of misinformed. I actually thought I was going to have this sort of fun. As it turns out, it's a lot of time consuming, difficult studies, and I'll reflect some of them in the next coming slides. All right, so what is the uh, local anesthetic of choice? And bupivacaine is deemed the gold standard. And I'll explain to some degree why there's not better alternatives. But what dose? And doses, believe it or not, from five to 20 milligrams have been described in the literature. And the a big advantage with using a lower dose has been described. It's highlighted by a pilot study by Ben David and colleagues where they reduced their hypertension by a third. Um, it was a pilot study and they compared 10 milligrams of bupivacaine with five milligrams of bupivacaine um, with a um, 25 mics of fentanyl. They had a very high failure rate, but that's besides the point. But um, they were able to do a lot of good things, one of which is they could reduce hypertension, nausea, ephedrine use, uh, block regression, and high maternal satisfaction. This has been shown by several studies. Now, the problem is what do you call low dose? So most people would say uh, 10 and below would be a low dose, um, but other definitions have been used, and I'll show you some data. So those are a lot of potential advantages, and I don't doubt any of those potential advantages. However, there are some significant disadvantages. If you've underdosed patient, you know that feeling where you have an inadequate block, uh, extra supplementation is required, and there is absolutely a litigation concern. And if you look at the data from the United Kingdom, it is the number one claims in the NHS in the cesarean section population, which is pain during cesarean delivery. The other problem with the smaller dose, it takes longer to work, and you actually get less intraoperative analgesia, so you can increase your nausea and decrease your maternal satisfaction consequentially. 
Um, this study was also highlighted by Alex Batwick in his um, talk yesterday. It was a very clever study because it took what we all thought, which is it's not a good idea to use really low doses, but put it in a form that we could actually analyze in the form of a meta-analysis. They use an arbitrary cutoff of eight milligrams or less as the low dose, and you can debate what, like I said, is the definition of low. But in the studies that use low doses, the failure rate was 10 to 50 percent. It once again depends on how you define failure, if it's conversion to general anesthetic or if it's patients complaining of pain or needing supplementation. But not only do they show a very high failure rate, you can see this forest plot, the requirement for supplementation intraoperatively was increased. So this is good evidence to say low blocks do not work as well as higher dose blocks. They showed reduced side effects, no doubt, but I think we've come such a long way in how we manage hypertension with the use of phenylephrine, either infusions or intermittent boluses, that hypertension has really not become the big problem that we need to avoid as much um, as we used to. But it is always a balancing act, and I'll try and show you the balancing act that we've tried to work out, which is what is your optimal dose for bupivacaine. Some of the studies were alluded to um, yesterday. Basically, they are studies to try and work out where the inflection turning point is, either at ED50 or ED95. In other words, where 50% of your dose is effective or 95%. And the idea behind these studies is to liberally to get failures at the low end and to get success in the other end, and then you can uh, do logistic regression analysis to try and work out where the break-even point is. The slide on the left is actually hyperbaric bupivacaine, heavy bupivacaine, um, with, and this is the important thing, morphine and fentanyl, we use a combination at Stanford, and it's at an academic center where most of the OBs externalize the uterus. So this is really at our institution and you've got to take what you want from it. You can see from a dose above 10 milligrams, we both had a success over block to T6, which, was the, which is in the grayed out area, and then anesthetic um, um, uh, um, success, which is patient not requiring any analgesia intraoperatively or no pain. The other graph is hypobaric bupivacaine, we repeated the same study. More variability, but we're eventually able to get a dose which is slightly higher. And if you use fancy statistics, which I won't go into, we found that a 12 milligram dose in our setting, once again combined with fentanyl and, and morphine, gave us a dose beyond which we felt that we were going to get reliable anesthesia. We also found that hyperbaric bupivacaine is more reliable than hypobupivacaine or plain bupivacaine. And that's not just us that have found that. There are several studies that have compared hyper and hypobaric bupivacaine. They generally uh, favor hyperbaric bupivacaine in terms of reliability. You also actually get less hypotension if you're doing it in the sitting position, which most of us do, because the block sets up slower with hyperbaric bupivacaine, which is an advantage. And the evidence d does suggest the use of hyperbaric bupivacaine, but obviously you can vary this within the setting you utilize it in. What about concentration and volume? So if you use a larger volume, if you are mix up your local anesthetic, it doesn't make a difference. And I'm showing two examples of that where varying concentrations are used, or one where a, a set dose of 15 milligrams, either in a 3cc dilution or an 18cc dilution, made very little to the block um, height or quality. So it really is a milligram issue. It is not about a volume or concentration in the intrathecal space. Um, this was touched on yesterday as well about obesity and uh, do you have to vary your dose and the thinking prior to the study that we conducted was that you probably should um, based on the fact that the case report showing very small doses would give you adequate anesthesia. Um, but in the, um, in the study that we did, we found very little dose uh, differences between obesity and non-obese. And the biggest problem with obese patients is it was a heterogeneic population. We had large variability in how patients responded. And our conclusion wasn't to pinpoint an actual dose, but was to say that morbid, obesity, morbid obese patients are probably better suited to a catheter-based technique. Um, so our cutoff of 40 and above, we would not do a single-shot spinal technique, uh, but rather do a CSE technique. Um, there's a lot of studies that have tried to look at height, weight, correlation, various other things, and it's been very difficult to show a good clear-cut uh, correlation or good formulas for working out adjustment of dose based on height and weight. So if you have uh, within reasonable extremes of height, you can just use your standard dose. 
If you have very short or very tall, you may consider a catheter-based technique for the same reason that the dose predictability is very difficult. All right, I've been rambling on about bupivacaine for the last little while. Well, what about other alternatives? And obviously, ropivacaine jumps to mind. Levobupivacaine is not marketed in this country. But in the one good study that really compared the two agents, but also accounted for potency difference, so 8 milligrams of bupivacaine versus ropivacaine, 12 milligrams, found that bupivacaine was a better agent. And this has actually been reported in several other studies. Uh, ropivacaine. Uh, gave you less hypertension, less nausea in the first few studies, and that looked very favorable. But the dose um, concentration, so the ropivacaine is about 40% less potent um, than bupivacaine, and this was not accounted for. So the effects we were seeing was really a dose effect and not a drug-specific effect. Um, but ropivacaine has proven to be less reliable in many studies, and I think it's not necessarily the drug per se, but the fact that it's prepared in a hypobaric solution. So you're really not comparing apples with apples. I think if you had a hyperbaric ropivacaine, it would probably give you as good a, uh, anesthesia than bupivacaine. The problem with ropivacaine, which bupivacaine has over it, is we've been using bupivacaine for many years without any problems. And um, it'll take a long time to convince me that there's a drug that's safer than bupivacaine in the intrathecal space. Well, local anesthetic only gets you so far, what about other additives? And obviously we all add an intrathecal opioid and there's good evidence for it. If you pull meta-analysis looking at patients reported discomfort intraoperatively, you can reduce it to around 4% versus 24% um, with uh, just local anesthetic only based techniques. So you improve your intraoperative analgesia significantly. So what agents can you use? You can use any agent that is lipophilic that will work quickly because you need its uh, onset of action quickly. Fentanyl is the prototype, but sufentanyl would be a reasonable analgesic to utilize. And all the advantages, like I mentioned about reducing your um, amount of local anesthetic in the examples that I showed you are apparent. So you're gonna get less side effects like hypotension. Um, interestingly, you decrease nausea and vomiting. You would think by giving an opioid, you would actually increase the side effect because we perceive um, an, uh, nausea and vomiting as an opioid-related side effect. In several studies have shown fairly convincingly that you decrease nausea. And I think this just means that you're getting better quality block intraoperatively and less pain and discomfort, especially from uh, uterine externalization. Um, so you actually decrease nausea. You do, however, increase itching. And itching tends to be a dose-related effect, so if you increase doses, you'll get more itching. I wish I could tell you an exact dose <coughs> that is necessary for, um, for this purposes. <coughs> Hunt showed a dose of 6.25 in a dose-ranging study. You got no benefit beyond that. Um, others have suggested slightly higher doses, but above 20, your side effect profile um, it is not um, it starts to increase and you're not getting increased analgesic benefits. So the dose is somewhere between 10 and 20. Now fentanyl and sufentanyl are fantastic intraoperative agents, but they do not give you meaningful postoperative analgesia. And this is a, from a meta-analysis data and Dahl and colleagues uh, overall was a four hour analgesic benefit um, of fentanyl. And you can see morphine, which I'll talk about in my next talk, having a much longer duration. So depending on the dose of fentanyl you can use, it'll range from anything from two to maybe six or eight hours with large doses of fentanyl. You'll pay the price with itching and various other side effects, but you're not gonna get meaningful post-operative analgesia. And in fact, you may even compromise the analgesia slightly. And this is, um, was suggested by previous authors and then led to us, us trying to study it. Uh, there was a perception if patients received intrathecal uh, fentanyl or um, sufentanyl, a lipophilic equivalent, that they required more morphine postoperatively. And the idea was either it was causing acute tolerance or it was blocking the immune receptors from binding of the morphine. So we did a study where we had either added no fentanyl, we had or 5, 10, or, uh, 5, 10 or 25 mics of fentanyl with our uh, standard morphine dose. And it's difficult to see um, in the graph because it's sort of all over, but if you use fancy statistics, there was actually a difference between those not receiving fentanyl and the doses receiving the fentanyl. So there was a real phenomenon, a small phenomenon, but it didn't lead to more analgesic use afterwards. 
and we feel based on the benefit that you get intraoperatively, it's worthwhile using. Because the problem with just using morphine, morphine can take up to 90 minutes to work. It does not provide meaningful intraoperative analgesia. And before I leave our local anesthetics and our opioids, I thought I would just throw in a little non-plug for meperidine. So meperidine is a short-acting lipophilic opioid, so theoretically it could work as well as fentanyl and sufentanyl, and it has local anesthetic properties. So there are descriptions of doing an entire cesarean delivery just with meperidine. The problem is it doesn't quite last long enough. 40 minutes are about the length of time it takes our surgeons to just get into the room and prep the abdomen. Um, and then you get really limited lo local um, duration of analgesia, and the biggest problem is the side effect profile. Terrible, terrible nausea has been reported in uh, higher doses that are required for cesarean delivery. And as you're aware, side effects are all relative to the setting, but if you have better alternatives to give patients, uh, certainly meperidine is not one of them. So I've rambled on a little bit, so just to summarize before I move on to future, um, future adjuvants that we can utilize. So it depends on your clinical setting, but a dose between 10 and 12 milligrams of hyperbaric bupivacaine, and I hope you're all utilizing that sort of dose, and fentanyl between 10 and 20 based on your utilization, and morphine 10 to 20. I'm going to talk a little bit about morphine, obviously, in my next lecture, so we'll leave that for a little while. If you are going to do a rapid spine, you don't have time to add opioids, um, or there's reasons to avoid it, then you obviously have to use more local anesthetic to get the large effect. And I'll strongly encourage you, if you are dropping your dose down to doses less than 10 milligrams, to utilize a catheter-based technique for all the reasons we highlighted with low dosing of bupivacaine. All right, I want to move on to a few future applications where we're working on as new adjuvants. It's not fair if I leave you behind with the latest um, science that's been looked at. And the first thing, we obviously have got a local and we've got an opioid, but we'd like to add other stuff to it to improve analgesia. But before I discuss them, I want to highlight an editorial that was written in response to a flood of publications where various people were trying different drugs in the intrathecal space with some idea that it may improve analgesia. And they put a stop to a lot of these, even if the drug, even if the study was approved in different countries, IOB approved because of potential risks, and they didn't want clinicians to go out using it. And the message from this particular um, editorial was that the burden of proof for safety must be overwhelming. We have agents that work very, very well, so you have to show significant efficacy before you even propose another agent, and then minimal side effects and no toxicity. So with that in mind, we'll move on to clonidine. So clonidine is easily the most studied drug, and particularly in a basic science setting, and because of the alpha-2 agonist effect and the local spinal action, we get really excited that it may be a valuable adjuvant, in particular because it's working in a different mechanism to our mu opioid receptors. And it has been shown to be a good analgesic, and it provides about five to seven hours following cesarean delivery. The problem we've had with uh, clonidine, and you can see by those dose ranges that I have on the slides, which is a very narrow therapeutic index. And when you see dose ranges like that report in the literature, it means one thing, there's unacceptable side effects and people are trying to reduce the dose down to maintain your analgesic effect without introducing side effects. But that's been the Achilles heel of clonidine, all those side effects, in particular hypotension, sedation, and bradycardia. There is an FDA black box warning so I think at this point in time, it is a drug that you would consider in select patients that you're struggling to manage their pain, uh, but certainly not for routine care. Well, neostigmine was mentioned in Kenneth Nelson's talk. It's a cholinesterase inhibitor, and it actually has quite impressive analgesia um, and prolongation of even the morphine effect that is utilized in the setting. However, once again, the Achilles heel, in particular for intrathecal administration, um, is the side effects. Nausea and vomiting, pretty much every patient is going to experience that. And there's various other nasty side effects, in particular involuntary defecation. Now that may be acceptable at Wake Forest, but it isn't acceptable here in California. <laughs> I told them I was going to take a cheap jab at him. So. <laughs> it seems like the side effects of epidural administration is actually lower. I don't know if this is a dose effect, dose phenomenon, but this is still one area that's being investigated, and it may be a, something that could be utilized, in particular added to existing epidurals and, and run post-caesarean delivery. 
And I'll end off with one last neuroaxial um, potential um, adjuvant, which is the NMDA antagonist. And you know ketamine pretty well, but you're not aware that magnesium has very similar mechanism action and may be a better agent because of its side effect profile. Ketamine hasn't been well studied in an OB population. A modest analgesic effect has been reported outside of OB. But magnesium may be an agent that we can consider utilizing as soon as the studies give us some guidance as to what's the best dose and what's the best route of administration. But doses of 500 milligrams epidurally have been shown to reduce pain and analgesic use. And intrathecal doses, small intrathecal doses, both following cesarean delivery and in a labor setting, have shown mixed results. And I think it's probably just a dose related um, phenomenon. Um, it may be an agent that has some utility in the future. So that's the um, intraoperative cesarean delivery talk. I'll be covering postoperative analgesia in my following one. Um, just to remind you that you can choose whatever technique you want. We feel spinal anesthesia is a technique of choice. But don't hesitate to consider a CSE technique in various populations. I've, dis I've discussed a few of them, but in any one that you feel that you can't reliably predict the response to your standard spinal dose. Um, the dosing, which we've already discussed, of 10 to 20, 12 milligrams of bupivacaine with an opioid. And the adjuvants, unfortunately, are not ready for prime time yet. It's something you can consider in select patients and discuss more of that in a little while. All right, thank you very much. And I'll... Mm -hmm.